the whole production this time is exceptional. Anton Corbin again was involved in designing the stage set. I really wanted Depeche to be different on stage this time. I really wanted people to go to the Depeche Mode gig and be surprised. Historically, Depeche have always had lots and lots of pre-recorded imagery projected on stage. Anton had said to the band, this time we want to use live cameras. I want to see live action on the screen. I wanted to do something that was different than we had done in the past. Um, and I think really something that would capture more so than ever the energy of the band. I had some ideas right from the word go, actually. Since you know, Anton mentioned you know, that the patch would be taking you know, live cameras this time, I, I had some really clear thoughts about how they should look. You know, using lots of mini cams, parasite cameras, I've called them, attached to the viewfinders of, of the main cameras. And, you know, using stuff like beads in front of the lenses and other foreign objects, cut out shapes, sort of very hardcore filters and, you know, really anything that I find along the way. I think he's also brought something new and fresh to what we're doing visually with the combination of using some of like Anton's visuals, but also bringing something dynamically to the video screens and uh, from what goes on actually in the performance. I don't think that, that has been done with Depeche Mode before. I absolutely adore live performance and you know to be involved in a band like Depeche Mode who really mean it every single night, I can never have too much of that. So the more they are passionate about what they do, the more I am and it's very easy for me to get carried away with people's live performances. There's no boy band style imagery on the screens on Depeche. You don't get a guy standing there, you know, in full four by three TV kind of top of the pops. There's none of those kind of it. There's none of that imagery on the screen. You can see a finger, a ring, one of Dave's tattoos for almost an entire song. I didn't realise how little of something you had to see to know what it was. It's just a really, really different way of looking at how you project a band. It's just pure energy. It's pure passion and energy, and it's it's 100% Depeche Mode. I think seeing the show now, what is amazing is that it really does capture it, and I think in some sense it captures it and also feeds the band, because the band I think is extremely together and energetic, and, and that comes across very, very well in this show, and it is um, original and changing every night, and I think that conveys itself very much, and I think the audience picks up on it, and I think it feeds the band, so everything kind of feeds itself. The band have become bigger than they ever have been before. Sold more tickets, two million tickets across 88 shows. It's a phenomenon, this tour, the success. 100% sold out dates in, I don't know how many countries, I think 25 countries. It's really incredible and it, and it amazes me that we're still managing to attract young teenagers to our music. It's very strange because uh, we're actually more popular now on a live scale than we were at our sales peak in, say, Violator. So we seem to be getting more and more popular, which is a bit odd, you know, sort of, the less records we release, the more popular we get live, you know. It's a bit strange. It's always a really daunting prospect for me going on tour, but um, once I actually get there, I, I, I really enjoy it. It's a lot harder at the age of 45 than it was at 21. And uh, it's not the actual gigs are harder. The gigs, it's, it's all the traveling and, um, and being away so long. But, you know, I still think it's a pretty cool job. We just completed eight shows in 10 days, which under any kind of circumstances is difficult. Um, but when you're flying to different places and flying after shows and, um, you know, certainly for the crew and everybody involved, 
who are driving in between some of these great distances, it's really, really quite demanding. A lot of Depeche Mode fans grumble, really, we don't work hard enough. <laughs> you know, we sort of tend to, tend to be in this routine now of uh, a tour every four years, you know. When in the 80s and 90s, it was a tour every year. If we played five shows a week and it was a country band, it would be all right, but because of the show is so energetic, it, it takes a lot of energy to do it. The first two legs, the American leg and the European leg, were very, very demanding. I think once the band got out there, all of a sudden realized how demanding this tour was and the multiple nights in a row. And one thing we changed for the next two legs, which are coming up in the spring and summer, are that we now have really moved away from doing three shows in a row and brought the schedule down a bit more at an easy pace. We were able to sort of make the scheduling slightly different so that we can actually really enjoy the performances more. Because it seems like when we do like two performances and there's a day off and then there's maybe one performance and a couple of days off and a it's just, we all enjoy it a lot more. The Featherman has become, um, it's like a little logo, you know, so they, they put it on all the merchandising everywhere. The Featherman thing uh, fascinated me from the word go. It was suggested a while back that I might want to use some animation with the John the Revelator live performance. Fairly quickly I came up with the idea of the Featherman, you know, coming to life and, you know, kind of skulking around the stage in the shadows, you know, the monkey on the, on the band's back and this sort of, you know, controlling, very controlling of the band. The master puppeteer, you know, mimics the band's moves and has a really strong influence and, and hold over the band. Um, but ultimately, Depeche Mode are in charge of the Featherman because it's their creation. <laughs> I kind of took a nosedive into like the idea of being a, you know, rock star and living that kind of fantasy life. There I was living in Los Angeles in Hollywood and, you know, in my mansion on the hill and uh, boy, they flocked there, you know, to come and be part of what, what was going on there. And for a while it was great fun and then it just wasn't, you know. I found myself in a pretty dark place and, uh, you know, fortunately with the help of sort of um, friends and, uh, only a couple of friends left at that point, um, include one of them being, you know, my, my wife today, Jennifer. You know, I was kind of led in the right direction. I'm not doing anything to myself today that is going to contribute to me sort of going down a, a dodgy road again, as much as I can help it, you know. I think that the way our shows have been paced has always been quite similar. Where we, we have had a like a slow section in the middle and then it starts building up again. 
and I usually sing a couple of songs in the middle and then you know, one maybe in the encores. Some of the songs that are acoustic with myself playing piano and Martin singing and we've sort of developed a bit of a rapport there musically which is you know we're also good friends so it's like it kind of helps I think you know you tend to sort of play like your relationship is so we've got a good understanding musically together certainly. I thought that I should definitely have some wings involved in my outfit. So I, 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 fortunately I've got a friend who's a designer in London and me and her together came up with the shirts and the, the trousers. The mohawk hat was a later addition because a fan turned up at an in-store in New York and just get, gave us all one and it seemed to you know, fit the outfit quite well. You had something to hide. Anton did the original design for the show on, on some drawings a bit like that. That's the, that was the first picture that we, I got from Anton. Lee probably has a very, very difficult job you know, translate, translating Anton's um, scrawls into a working stage set. I'm not a very good drawer, I have to admit, so I make a little drawing. It's, to me, it's always very um, um, easy to read and understand. Uh, but they look at it and laugh a bit, but then it usually happens. He tried, tried to explain to us this ball thing that he was, this globe, and you know, we, none of us knew what it was going to look like. We didn't really see anything more until uh, we actually turned up at rehearsals. But again, that goes to how much we trust him, you know. He was very particular about the way he wanted it to look and feel and the surfaces, the, you know, the colours, everything. It's playful and it's a little bit Jules Verne-y. The ball is, is many things. Initially, I wanted to have more letters on it and be much more chaotic, but they couldn't make that, so we just have a couple of words on it. I call it the communicator because the pages are um, totally non-communicative on stage. Uh, they don't talk between songs. It's incredible, really. Anton has um, been with us for a long time and has been responsible for a lot of, like, uh, visually what we've, we've been doing for years. And I think he's a very important aspect to what Depeche Mode is and has been. He's helped make us cool. Because without him, we wouldn't be cool, as you can see. On this tour, everybody feels close to each other and so compact, playing and uh, also enjoying it. And uh, uh, you really can tell. And I think it's a, quite a feng shui kind of uh, stage. I think they got a lot of confidence because the album is, is doing well and the audiences are so fantastic. The production is great. And so the whole thing gives them confidence. I put everything I can into the show. Um, it's what's important to me and um, I always feel like there's fans have paid good money to come and see a good show and uh, I'm going to do my damnedest to uh, deliver that. The day of the show is extremely demanding and, and for Christian it's extremely demanding. I mean, they, came, they come off stage dripping with sweat. You know, if I get like a couple of beads then, then uh, that, that's been like a really you know, de demanding performance for me. <laughs> What I do up on stage is pretty physical and so, you know, I kind of throw my body into the performance. It's something that I've always done and now I'm getting a little bit older, you know, I'm starting to really feel. <laughs> Even if we try to get to go on stage and, and maybe take it easy, in the third song we're both like, you know, because we're pushing ourselves. When it really is all clicking together and you get that once in a while where everything falls into place, you're kind of like floating on air. 
is because everything that's involved in that, the band performing, the way you're interacting together, and, and of course the audience. I think that the, the shows are definitely the most exciting that we've ever performed. And I think we, we seem to take it up a notch each time we go on tour. I don't know how long that will go on for. <laughs> we included Just Can't Get Enough because we haven't played it for a few years and we were playing a lot of new stuff and um, we wanted, to, we thought it was fair to, for the, the fans, all the fans really, to play some old, old stuff as well. And it's a great live number, it always has been. There's always a lot of opinions when, whenever that song's been mentioned as, as regards whether we're going to do it or not. But um, I think ultimately it works because it, it, you know, it's of its time and it, 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 you, don't, it, you don't have to take the thing too seriously. You know, it is what it is and um, everyone has fun with it and it goes down great. You know. It's a bit of a struggle sometimes play, playing it but it, you know, it, there are, there, there are nights when we feel like it really doesn't fit in with anything else, but um, you know, we see it as a present to the fans. I'm still kind of as uncomfortable at, at times on stage as what I've ever been. You know, I know that I'm able to get the audience to sort of uh, participate with me, if you like, and, um, and the band, and, uh, but I'm still uncomfortable in that position. <laughs> Um, I, even after all these years, it's like sometimes it's it, it, excruciatingly uncomfortable. But I also know that there's some kind of mission that I'm supposed to be there doing it. And uh, you know, although sometimes afterwards I want to just lock myself away in my hotel room and you know order a cheeseburger and watch whatever dodgy you know TV there is. And I I still take the best you got Even though I'm sure it's not The best for me The feeling among the camp at the moment is great, so I think that comes across during the, the uh, performance. Certainly the relationship between the band on stage is better than it's ever been. We really think at the moment, although we've been together a long time, we really think we're reaching a a peak, you know, and uh, which is really good to do that after such a long time together. The band felt more, much more like a band than they have done for years when they were working together in the studio and now as well where they're on stage. So I think all that makes a big contribution to the, to the success. All those different influences that come together in, in our personalities and in the kind of music that we like or that we want to kind of put into what is Depeche Mode is quite different. That's what's been part and parcel of why Depeche Mode has remained fresh. We still think we've got a lot to offer so we still think we can go even better. We feel that we are still creating something special so um, it's important to continue that. There's no one can mess with Depeche Mode and what we've created together so far. It's always going to be there. There's 25 years of music that we've made together and to me this tour is kind of like a celebration of all of all that time together and to be on stage together and really kind of enjoying it um, to me kind of it, it feels like you know I'm okay with that I'm happy to kind of if that was the end of it I'd be happy to leave it there you know because I, I feel like that we've created so much together that's great and doesn't mean that we won't do it, do it again in the future but I just feel like it, I'm okay with it you know it's like I'm at peace with it at last I'm not battling anymore to try and prove to anyone, mainly myself, that I'm worthy. <laughs> like all soul sisters, yeah. Soul yeah. yeah. Like all soul sisters and soul brothers. Like all soul sisters and yeah.